and a very warm welcome to today's CBI at 10. Um, whether you are watching us live or whether you're listening on catch up. If you are watching us live, as always, please feel free to post questions and I will put them to our gathered panel of esteemed experts who are here with us. Um, there's a lot to get through today. We're talking um, about shortages, shortages of supply, shortages of labour, shortages of energy and the sort of composite impact that all of that is having on our ambition to go for growth in 2020. Um, I'm going to start with Matthew before we get into the meat and potatoes of today's conversation. Matthew, there's some announcements coming this afternoon as it relates to COVID. Could you just give us a sort of heads up on what we might expect? Yeah, thanks, Liz. And hi, everybody. Look, uh, the COVID story is never far away from us on these uh, webinar series. So look, on the back of some good news, I think, last week around the reduction from seven to five days on self-isolation and easing of international travel restrictions, the good news is it feels like that cases are continuing to fall and therefore the optimism that the restrictions can ease is on the up. Uh, people will have been reading uh, in the news, I'm sure, about the likelihood of the so-called Plan B restrictions coming to an end, particularly around the sort of work from home mandate, uh, COVID secure passporting and so on. That feels consistent with some of the conversations we've been having with government. So watch this space but we understand that uh, announcements may come as soon as Wednesday uh, afternoon, and then we'll be expecting uh, clarity about what happens from the 26th uh, of January onwards. I think, Liz, from a CBI perspective, look, the easing of those restrictions, particularly the working from home mandate, should be good news. Uh, it's better for business, and it's certainly good for those who are reliant on footfall in city centres and town centres and so on. Uh, but we're really keen, actually, that we make sure some of that basic infrastructure around masks, ongoing access to free testing and so on, continues so we don't end up in this situation as we have in the past, where we're having to lurch from sort of restrictions tightening if the situation worsens and then eases again. But if we can get to this steady state and using some of those COVID secure tools, that feels like a good way through to us. But watch this space. Uh, we're expecting some encouraging news uh, imminently. Thanks ever so much, Matthew. That's good to hear. Um, and yes, yeah, certainly don't want to get into a situation where we suddenly lurch back to these horrible absences that have been sort of crippling us in terms of short term. We're not here to talk about short term shortages. We're here to talk about the more structural stuff. And it's a very different set of um, prescription actions that um, business leaders in particular need to be taking. And indeed, the resources that CBI are making available to members to help see their way through. Um, as I said, there's sort of three evil triplets to this, if you like, um, labour market, supply chain and, and energy. I'm tempted to start with supply chain if we can. I'm going to come to Jenny Beckwith in a second. We'll, we'll do labour. But let's start with the supply chain stuff. Matthew, just give us a sense of you know, how these three factors are affecting one another. And then let's pick away at supply chain to begin with. And I'll come to Richard. Yeah, super. Look, there's totally right. I mean, that is how we're sort of bucketing the issues up in some way. And you're right, they're completely interconnected. But uh, Jenny will touch more on labour shortages. But I think the sort of the 30 second version of that is it's happening at multiple levels in multiple sectors and multiple parts of the country. And its impact is sort of firstly holding down uh, artificially almost holding down the capacity in firms. So they're unable to benefit from the sort of full upswings in demand when it comes. And also we're seeing complete, complete sort of war for talent going on, basically. So recruitment is really hard. Everyone's fishing in the same pool. That's pushing up salaries and so on. So it's making it tough. On supply chains, look, I mean, I think this has its origins uh, in COVID. And it's been a symptom almost of the stop-start nature of the global economy over the last two years, which has kind of meant that production has been uh, stop and start. It's meant that we've had activity sort of dislocated. Uh, in different parts of the world that's led to disruption and sort of shipping and things like that which Richard is much more expert on and we'll talk about uh, in a moment and the sort of end result I think for firms is probably increased lead times in many cases it's certainly unpredictable so that's hard to give your customer a sort of precise target date for when you might be able to fulfill an order it's also pushing up costs because again everyone wants the same stuff uh, and things like that, and they all want it as soon as possible. So everyone's fighting over that as well. And then just to complete the picture, Liz, you mentioned the three, but the third one, of course, is energy crisis and prices, yeah. uh, which is also uh, front and center of the news. 
uh, and the backstory here is clearly one again it's a global issue global wholesale gas prices are very high but the uk in particular bears the brunt from that because we have a particular reliance uh, on it in, and certainly in our en energy generation our electricity generation mix and so on and it's everyone's hurting actually i mean of course the sort of consumer facing story is the one that dominates the news headlines rightly so because it's significantly adding to the sort of cost of living pinch we think it'll probably take something in the order of about 20 billion pounds out of consumer spending so it harms the economy and probably pushes up inflation by one or two percent when the price cap uh, is if acts as expected goes up later this year so it's hurting consumers but it's also hurting businesses too it uh, adds to the sort of cost pinch that's coming through from wages from supply chain issues we've just been talking about energy layered on top of that particularly i think for some of the energy intensive sectors where other countries and other governments have stepped in with greater levels of support so there's an international competitiveness issue for the uk right. uh, and the final bit of that is just to say look energy suppliers themselves are, are not having it easy it's sort of um the, the effect of the price cap not keeping pace with global wholesale prices means that margins are very very significantly squeezed at a time when we want really significant investment going in to the green agenda and also when they're picking up uh, customers from failed energy suppliers who are on much uh, sort of cheaper deals and so on uh, the, the the cost of acquisition and the cost of servicing those customers uh, is also not a great good news story for them either so it's hurting always round on the energy front and then there's bringing all those issues together I think what the what in a sense we've been dealing with for a prolonged period of time now is just all of those short-term urgent headaches layered one on top of one another they impact in their own right as i've just described but it's also taking up a huge amount of bandwidth resilience emotional energy in firms to be grappling with all of these things and it's crowding out the time and space for companies to be thinking about how do i get ahead of the long-term uh, important trends coming down the track such as net zero such as automation such as technology such as a changing workforce and so on so i think when you have the cocktail of issues coming together in the way that I've just described it. That is the sort of net net result. It's crowding out the focus on the long term when we really want to be going for growth. Yes, yeah, some really complicated picture, Matthew. And thanks for the introduction of sort of getting a sense of how these things are working together. Um, I know that the CBI are working very hard to put together some quite meaty resources to support members through um, which will make sure um, are made available to the people who are watching live and of course if you're listening back they are on the CBI website for you and we'll talk about a bit about what's in those a little bit later on. I'm going to come now if I can to Richard Ballantyne who is with us um, you're the chief executive of the British Port Association. Hi Richard thanks for being here. Good morning Liz thanks very much for having me. Um, Richard, as, as the British Ports Association, what are the issues impacting your members? We talked a lot on CBI webinars and sort of towards the back end of last year about lorry drivers, but it's, it's a wider issue than that. Just give us a sense from your perspective what's happening in supply. Yeah, it's great to be with you, as I said, and thanks so much. And thanks also to the CBI team for all the, the lobbying and promotion and noise that generally you make on our behalf as one sector amongst many. I think the fundamental thing I'll start with, ports like many other uh, organisations on this call and other members of the CBI, we're employers as well. We employ collectively around 115,000 jobs uh, across the UK. And uh, that means that ports like others have been looking at ways to mitigate the impacts of COVID, to secure workplaces, to, to work up new arrangements and measures over the last two years, uh, which, has, which has flown by, I'm, I'm sure many of uh, the participants will agree. But there's been a lot of hard work that's gone into that. So thanks to the CPI for all your support and help in uh, signposting and also uh, um, uh, discussing some of these issues with government. More specifically on supply chain issues with the topic of today's uh, discussion, um, the ports, uh, they, they, they do a lot of different types of things in, in the UK from sort of servicing offshore oil uh, production uh, and uh, offshore renewable energy activities through to uh, conventional uh, bulk cargoes uh, and right down to unitized cargoes, things like containers and um, roll on, roll off units coming through from places like Europe. And, and the, I guess the thing that's really caught the attention in the media has been containers. So this is around 15% of our activities in the UK and containers is a very, uh, by definition, a very global 
uh, market. So we if effectively import a lot of goods that are manufactured from places like Asia, China, etc. They come around on ships, takes around 35, 40 days to get to the UK, to get to Northern Europe, where we still have a very viable and um, you know uh, valuable consumer market in the UK of getting on for 70 million people, as does the continent of Europe. Um, and those goods come into some of our big container terminals. They go into big hubs in Europe as well, and some are fed across. And what we've seen uh, post lockdown is that, uh, first of all, we had issues in China getting the goods out. Then our economies closed down because governments took the uh, decision mm -hmm. uh, to restrict activity, to close shops, to close uh, other non-essential activities, which led to a bit of a, a backlog and uh, lots of queues of traffic um in terms of you know storage in terms of uh, demand in terms of warehousing uh, and that we haven't really got to grips with that fully we, we we're not in the worst situation in terms of the ports and supply chain and the the shipping markets but we are seeing issues where empty containers are being you know it's been difficult to get them back to asia to be filled up and stocked and all this is a set to a backdrop of increased shipping prices where the shipping industry is rushing to, to make hay while the sun shines, so to speak, because uh, they've been really squeezed since the uh, the last recession, but now um, prices are so high, they want to be delivering things. So they're rushing to get these full containers around the world. And effectively what it's done is led to a big load of uh, backlogs in uh, particularly Europe, Europe and North American ports uh, and beyond. Uh, but we are just about getting to grips with that now. So the, the containers are getting back to Asia, they're being filled up. Uh, and it, of course, uh, I think Matthew mentioned effectively a perfect storm. You have a few issues that a uh, couple on top of this or, or uh, double up things like uh, labour shortages. And of course, haulage is the very you know well publicised issue, uh, as we, we know some of the reasons there's an ongoing haulage shortage anyway in the UK. Our departure from the EU certainly exacerbated that challenge. And effectively what it's meant is that domestic drivers in the UK uh, they, there's less of them. So it, it means that goods that arrive into UK ports are generally taking longer to be collected and delivered to their end destinations. Uh, now, you know, it's not a terminal issue. It's just add, adding extra costs, extra time uh, to a process that's already been hit by, you know, those those empty container issues and, and other factors. So we're getting there now. You know, um, of course, Brexit comes around the corner, the next the next stage of the transition that that hasn't exactly helped, but we we appear to be managing. Uh, but the final sort of word I give to my introductory statement is is that a lot of the deep sea carriers are saying that there could be some congestion, some issues with the supply chain for at least another year. So you know we're not through this yet. Thanks ever so much, Richard. You preempted my question. I was going to say you painted a very clear picture of what caused the, the sort of bottleneck, the sort of traffic, as I imagine it, only in the sea, um, and, and how long it will take to sort of unwind some of that stuff. And I fully understand on the cost base, when you talk about shipping, that it's really the, de the demand that is giving the sort of inflationary cost pressure on shipping. Do you think that that will maintain on the cost of shipping? Or do you think this is a sort of temporary thing that will then all settle down when everything starts to ease again? I think there's evidence it has started to settle down somewhat, although I'm sure some of your the CBI members who are importing goods may uh, have some sort of anecdotal examples of how their costs have stayed higher than before. But we are seeing certainly um, uh, decreases and, and slight declines on um, the shipping costs that are, you know, that are uh, a routine, you know, fixed fixed costs and things that that, that, that generally go up and down when uh, contracts change, et cetera. Whereas if you just turn up in, in China, so to speak, and you want to get a container around, those you know, spot rates, those sort of daily rates are still fairly high. But things have gone down, fortunately. Um, but equally, you know, if I, as I said before, if I'm an importer, a uh, small business in the Midlands, wherever it may be, away from the shipping industry, I'm sure there are some, um, you know, sort of um, sorry stories from those sectors about their costs being high. Um, thanks ever so much, Richard. Is it a fair question at all? Because we've grappled with this a bit in conversations with CBI members over the last, well, two years, really. Um, do you have a sense of beyond the next 12 months or are you really just sort of focusing on 
the immediate challenges and then we'll worry about 2023 when it comes do you have a sense of what might be further down the line yeah i think um i think really long term which isn't probably what you meant but you know out for the next 30 years we are seeing the expectation of unitized traffic so that's containers and roll off roll, roll on roll off units vehicles trailers etc we ask we are predicting quite dramatic increases um, in that traffic both globally and in the uk and we're seeing port operators and shipping lines responding to those demands uh, with long-term investments in new infrastructure new equipment etc uh, and more short term we are confident that things will settle down give us a bit of time to the maritime sector but we are confident things will settle down but i think it's safe to say that the new norm is probably a, a one that's a bit more sensitive to changes and dramatic changes and you know we we haven't really i mentioned brexit briefly but we haven't really um you know broached that topic really because about half our trade is with the european union and a lot of that is through unitized cargoes particularly being driven either driver a company through the short straits or unaccompanied which is effectively uh, trailers that are dropped in european ports and then collected in uk ports after their seaward journey and you know those pressures on new uh, border controls we've got customs at the moment but the big thing for us will be the animal and plant health based products so anything coming through for example tulips from the netherlands that ends up in our supermarkets or florists here uh, all those will have to be checked in uh, a range of different ports not just those in the short straits and that adds time that adds costs there'll be costs of inspections uh, and and those kind of things i think our, our logistics sector is just going to have to deal with for the next uh, 12 months have to take on the chin unfortunately because although the government has done a huge amount um, in, in its uh, it would say to mitigate some of the impacts you cannot escape um, a lot of these kind of physical processes which will definitely have a cost impact and a, and a time impact as well thanks ever so much it's just completely fascinating um just imagining that whole world is so alien to me but i was delighted to see the tulips had arrived in waitrose yesterday it's the first sign of spring so i was thrilled um thanks ever so much richard we'll, we'll come back to you if you've got any questions for richard please do let us know um jenny jenny beckwith thanks very much for for being here you're the sort of employment guru at the cbi and labor shortages is something we've discussed as we said at the beginning, sort of acute challenges in labour, which largely relates to COVID, and then a much more structural long-term challenge that feels like a shift in the labour market that everybody is grappling with. And it doesn't just affect one sector or one type of worker, it's kind of throughout. So Jenny, just to, uh, to open the bidding on this, because I think it's a really huge topic and very live. How, Where are we now and how did we get here? Thank you very much, Liz, and uh, brilliant to be with you uh, today. So I think um, the short answer to that is just uh, the real gap between the labour supply that the UK has and the demand for labour. And we had data out just yesterday saying um, that vacancies continue to be at a record high. We've had that for the last five months, uh, vacancies over one million. And it really is uh, a coalescence of factors um, on the on the supply constraint side. Um, the fundamental change is the introduction of the points based immigration system that has changed the game in terms of the terms that people can enter the UK. Um, and of course, the legacy impacts of COVID um, first accelerating the um, uh, uh, rate of EU nationals leaving the UK, but also having an effect on people staying in their jobs for the first year, then inevitably much more churn as people were wanting to move around and, and find alternatives, but also a, a longer term uh, factor from COVID as well, where people are just reevaluating what they want from work and it's caused a lot of people to take early retirement so in total we've had about 400,000 people of working age leave the UK labour market we've had about 146,000 EU nationals leave and that has put particular pressure on um, firms as you say across sectors I think on the flip side on the demand side um, you know, part of, of this is, is what Richard was talking about as, as a huge reopening um, and uh, strong customer demand. But I think the other thing that I would add is 
customer demand has also changed in how we're operating in a post-COVID world. So we are, you know, e-commerce and home deliveries, we're not going to move away from that. And that means um, even more demand for warehouse operatives and drivers, adding to additional pressures that the logistics uh, sector is facing that Richard mentioned. Similarly, this change to remote and hybrid working, it means that IT professionals, cybersecurity professionals have never been in more demand. And those are just two examples of areas um, where we had existing skills gaps, people gaps before COVID. And then the way in which businesses are now operating, customer demand is operating, means that there is additional pressure on the demand side. And I think, you know, what does all that mean? Well, the competition is fierce, as Matthew, as Matthew said, but I think the one additional thing that I would say that has really changed the game and is going to have to be a consideration for how firms respond in the future is all of a sudden, particularly for businesses that have roles that can be done remotely um, or in a hybrid way, all of a sudden the competition isn't just from your local labour market, but potentially uh, what um, if you're a regional business, and I'm, and I'm sure that there are many on the call um, uh, now, facing pressures um, from competition in cities or the London waiting on terms and conditions and pay, for example. Um, Jenny, there's a, there's a lot to go at in there. My first question, um, having heard about the early retirement factor, which of course is the dream, sadly not a present reality for, for me, do you think that the cost of living pinch which is a very significant and real factor that for all hitting all of us in this in this country do you think that might unwind or at least diffuse some of that does people find that they just can't afford to leave the labor market altogether in in quite as short order as they thought they might um i think it is likely that certainly um as we're facing cost of living crisis the pressure on wages does mean that there is um a uh, 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 an incentive, I guess, for people to re-enter the labour market. But what I would say on that on that specific point about um, early retirement, th that is voluntary early retirement. And I would wager that the likelihood is people in that category have made a decision that they are financially able to do so, not least because um, they may have experienced saving increases during COVID. Um, right. And I think that it's unlikely that that older age group is likely to re-enter the labour market, where I think it is more likely, but doesn't speak necessarily directly to the cost of living point, is where students and younger people have made a decision to delay entering the labour market because of instability about what the jobs market would be. And I think it is likely that we're going to see um, a, a much higher proportion of people in the next two to three years at that younger age group leaving education and coming back into work. Mm. Yeah, interesting. Um, and Je Jenny, let's let's go to the point about wages. We had um, a conversation, I think it was about November time, maybe October time, about labour shortages um, and a leader of a business, a, a poultry farming business was with us and he was really struggling to fill his very seasonal um, vacancies. And he talked about how really the only weapon in his armory was wage increases, was re to really strongly incentivize people who perhaps wouldn't typically be the kind of people that he would be able to recruit for that work to bring them in and, and, and help him to deliver what he needed to deliver. Beyond wage, well, first, I suppose the first question is, is the inflationary pressure on wages going to sustain? And secondly, beyond wages, what else can companies be doing to make sure that they are on their putting their best foot forward in this, as you say, increasingly competitive market for talent? Mm. Yeah, so maybe on that first point first, um, I think it is fair to say that we are likely to see a continuation of the tight labour market, not least because I think some of the structural factors that we've just talked about, um, there's there's not a likelihood that that is going to change and probably means that for the next 18 to two, 18 months to two years, um, that will continue. I think the, uh, the picture on pay is a little bit more complex. Um, uh, it is very likely that um, there continues to be upward wage pressures um, I think it is likely that it might stabilise from the very high rate that it's been currently. It's it's partly distorted by the the data is partly distorted by the furlough impacts from last year, but tight labour market 
um, upward pressure on wages very, very likely. And I think the impact of that is um, twofold. First, um, the pay pressure is one that is not going to be sustainable for firms unless it is backed up with productivity increases. So I think the, the first thing to say on what can firms do about this situation and how are organisations that are most effectively going to navigate it, um, uh, how are they likely to? I think it's first on um, maximising the productivity of your existing workforce, and that could be through enablers like technology, technology adoption so that you're deploying staff um, in the areas where you most need it, upskilling and um, investing in staff so that they are not just um, upskilled but also more likely to retain, and things like leadership and management um, uh, investment so that people are staying, you know, people, people stay at their organisation um, when they're in a great team and when they're with a line manager um, that is supportive of their health and well-being and supportive of their um, career development, but also um, uh, is uh, is an organ creates an organisation which is a nice place to work. So those aspects of existing um, maximising the productivity of your existing staff, I think, is one thing for organisations to consider. And the other fundamental one is. What are the reasons why people want to join your organization and people want to stay? Like pay is one part. There are lots of different stats online for, for what staff want from work. What we do know is pay is not the only factor and it is not the only factor when it comes to um, why people um, uh, want, to, want to stay in an organization. Other huge impacts are people's ability to work in work arrangements um, which suit their lifestyle. So, for example, are you considering what notice you're giving to staff around their shift patterns? What compensation are you giving to staff if you cancel those at last minute? Are people able to work core hours and then work flexibly outside? Um, but it might also be that people are staying not just for um, uh, sort of direct pay, but the wider benefits package too. Um, and that could include things like family friendly policies, um, sick pay um, and, 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 and things like that. So I would say that the, the broader, the broader, the broader way for organisations to tackle this, to think about everything they can do. Um, it's really why would an individual want to join the organisation to stay and how can you maximise the productivity of your existing staff? Really interesting. There's a sort of there's no silver bullet. Frustratingly, I wish there was one. Um, Jenny, there's all, that long list. There's a real sort of package of things that people can do to help. And I think that that's some of the content in the CEO action plan, right? That the CBI has put together to sort of help people just mark their own homework, I guess. Um, in terms of how well they're performing against all these various different levers that they might not be immediately obvious in terms of filling the skill gap. Um, and that's published now on the CBI website. If that's right. Yep, exactly. Um, exactly. And I think links for that will be um, uh, will be circulated. I think it's helpful for two things. I mean, one is just having the ideas, the long list um, almost of ideas for how can you maximise your job attractiveness and the potential of your labour market? Um, how can you adopt tech to uh, maximise your people power? Um, how can you lead and manage to boost productivity and how can you invest in skills? So it does share ideas for that. But what I also think it is helpful for is um, for organisations to determine what their strategy is. As you said, there is no silver bullet, no one size fits all. And that's because the structural impacts or the structural effects or the impacts of the structural effects of your local labour market will be different for firms. What firms have done already and the effectiveness of that will be different. And also what budget and what resources firms have is, uh, is going to be different. So I think as well as ideas, what I hope um, the action plan is helpful for for firms is just going through uh, a, a step by step process to determine their response, to understand what the problem is that they're facing, to understand the impact of any actions that they've taken so far, and really um, assess what their business needs and how they can mobilize um, all of the different aspects of the team, because it's gonna take um, uh, not just 
um, HR directors, it's going to take operational leads, it might take um, mm -hmm. chief technology officers, you know, how do you mobilise the resources of the whole organisation to be leaving no stone unturned, frankly, in um, uh, maximising why an or why an individual would want to join, stay and be as productive as possible in your organisation. Thanks ever so much, um, Jenny. And there's some some good um, ideas and examples and a great pointer towards you know how to sort of innovate in your recruitment processes and reskilling initiatives and all that good stuff is available in that in that report. Matthew, I'm going to come back um, if I can um, to energy um, just as we sort of head into the final chunk of of the session. Um, just talk us you sort of gave us a bit of a setup um at the beginning on energy and i think we're all really clearly understand as individuals um how my gas bill is going to change because i had a text from my energy supplier yesterday telling me to sort of brace myself but it's perhaps less obvious how that lands on businesses and what businesses and the cbi and the government can do to alleviate some of those pressures would you just sort of unpack that a little bit for us yeah, sure. Thanks, Liz. I mean, look, I think uh, as uh, similar to Labour in a sense, isn't it? Look, no business is in exactly this. You no know, two businesses are in exactly mm -hmm. the same kind of situation. I think there is uh, there's a bit of a general sort of cost pressure on all businesses just because energy tends to feed through your supply chains in some way, shape, or form. Even if you're in sort of fairly simple, like the CBI is sort of professional services context and things like that, you know, heat and lighting and buildings and things like that. There's those sort of general costs that it adds to. But I think particularly acutely, if you're in one of the uh, energy intensive sectors, you know, sort of steel, ceramics, those kind of industries, uh, energy obviously makes a quite significant part of your uh, of your cost base. Uh, mm -hmm. And there, if it's been rising as it has been. Uh, businesses don't have the, the the benefit of a sort of price cap as uh, as it as applies to consumers, for example. Uh, some of the larger companies have been able to hedge their uh, prices uh, for a bit into the future, but a lot of those are coming off now too uh, as well. Uh, and generally, the situation there is because other governments have stepped in with various measures to alleviate those costs in the short term. Uh, if you've got significantly higher input costs than your international rivals, clearly that's not a very clever situation uh, from a point of view of winning orders and winning business kind of thing. So I think we view there are things that are within the government's gift to do to help in the short term, particularly for those energy intensive businesses to alleviate some of the, the costs and the reliefs on those. But look, the common thread through all of this, Liz, has been no silver bullet. And I'm afraid it's true of energy as well. I, I think this is actually a the real solution lies in a, a sort of more medium to long term play. We should help those most in need in the short term, both on the consumer front and the energy intensive industries to help get through and try and smooth the pain as best we can. But the regular, the long term play, I think, Liz, has to lie in regulatory form to end up with a new market structure. You know, mm -hmm. uh, what we've seen play out in the UK is actually we've we've sort of gone all in on competition without thinking through some of the consequences of that and my suggestions would be in terms of regulatory reform we probably need a higher bar in the future for market access if you're an energy supplier and wants to play yeah. in this that needs to be a sort of tougher higher bar uh, second i think there's probably some lessons from the uh, financial sector and the financial crisis where we now have quite sort of ongoing pretty stringent stress tests for example for different scenarios and things like that there's probably some lessons we could grab from that and apply to the energy sector in the future of how that's managed so tougher stress tests and then the, the third bit really has to be i think you know we, we want a big play on about a sort of sustainable market so continuing to encourage the investment in the green plays uh, and so on which uh, means it's much more within the uk's gift rather than the sort of uh, at the whim of the global markets and so on mm -hmm. Uh, and then a sort of final ingredient would be a sort of no surprises regime as best we can uh, get it on, on prices sort of thing. So those, I think, feel like the component parts of what needs to be quite a significant regulatory reform uh, play uh, to mm -hmm. overhaul the structure of the market. And mm -hmm. that's kind of what's going to be required in the medium to long term once we get past these short term pain points as best we can with hopefully a little bit of support from the government along the way. 
Indeed, no, no um, not an insignificant to-do list for somebody on, on regulatory reform there, Matthew. Richard, um, I wanted to just come back to you before we finish up in, in a few minutes' time. Um, we've heard from Jenny about a sort of whole smorgasbord of things that companies can be doing to help alleviate some of the pressure, particularly on labour shortages. I wonder if in your sector you might share with us some of the specific things that your members have been doing to try and, I mean, I know that there are some particular challenges that your sector is facing, but in the round, things about inclusion, things about leadership, things about incentives, things about the environment, what sorts of changes have you seen in your sector that might you know, be useful for people to hear? Yeah, it's very interesting what, what Jenny was saying, actually, and I think it's very pertinent to a discussion on supply chain issues, is that labour is right up there with one of the main challenges. Um, I think the issue ports, ports are, are often in areas of high deprivation around our coastal regions. They don't necessarily have um, a number of job applicant shortages. What they do have, I'm sure a lot of people can relate to this, is those people with the direct, you know, relevant experience and skills. Uh, they're, they're almost kind of ready to hit the ground running type um, applicants. So that, that that's a challenge. And what ports have been doing um, we're just starting out this journey, really. So we're working with FE colleges across the across the board, particularly around the larger um, uh, uh, port gateways, to work with the local colleges to design sort of skills pipeline courses to make sure that logistics and and, and ports and other uh, relevant um, activities are included, so that young people firstly have an idea that ports exist because. Believe it or not, a lot of people don't really know much about ports in the UK. We're a rather sort of forgotten about sector on on many levels, handling freight as opposed to you know passengers, where a lot of the transport focus is from policymakers, et cetera. So working with colleges to design schemes to get young people and others interested in a career in ports is something that we're doing at the moment. Us mm -hmm. as the association are looking to supplement that by highlighting the different types of roles there are. And, and I'm sure this is a generic factor. Ports, like others, um, other industries, are looking at modernizing technology and for a sector that's very traditional uh, in terms of, you know, our labor footprint and uh, you see a lot of men working uh, in the port sector. We think that um, getting, you know, innovation, automation, smart technologies is going to be a good way to attract a different type of person with different kind of experience, different skills and a different, you know, kind of uh, diverse range of people, which, you know, we can double up our uh, um, uh, a pull to different types of, uh, of people. So, yeah, there's there's a lot going on there, but you know the the kind of immediate challenge, as Jenny was saying, I think is very much with us for the time being, and and we are noticing HR managers and directors at ports, uh, recruitment specialists, at finance specialists are noticing that. I think Jenny mentioned the term churn, that's mm -hmm. definitely an issue. And whilst we have certain niche topic, you know, niche activities in ports, marine jobs, etc., where there is a bit of a a shortage those more generic roles in administration finance hr marketing uh you know pr etc uh managerial roles we are seeing that sort of um uh, the the employee has a, a a kind of a higher expectation of salary higher expectation of certain you know kind of uh, arrangements whether they're working remotely etc so ports like others have got to respond to that They've got to compete in this um this very sort of national network at the moment finally just when we we talk to government about things like trade deals traditionally we were always talking about sort of nitty-gritty issues like customs controls and, and border processes now i'm seeing a lot more interest in you know kind of labor and skills being included in trade deals for example india you know just started talking with the dit about um uh, a trade deal with india so we as a sector the maritime sector are keen that sort of marine professionals are included within the arrangements there so we can get um, uh, particular type of skills uh, from India to come over to the UK. Thanks so much, Richard. It's a, right in the thick of it is how I would summarise. But I mean, it's a fascinating test bed in many ways, as you say, a traditional industry, short term pressures, you know, ambitious long term plan, lots of new technologies that are going to sort of change the frame. Um, I'd love to sort of see you again in, in two years time and see how things are different. Matthew, before we close, um, there's, we've, we've, there's a lot of moving parts in all of this and I'm conscious that people um, listening and, and watching might be thinking oh my good grief 
where do I start? What's going to happen? It's 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 not an easy time to be a business leader. And you mentioned a tool that the CBI has been working on that I think just in terms of getting a sense of shared experience, getting a bit of context um, that I think people might find, you know, genuinely helpful. Um, just to give us a bit of a sense of what that is and how people can get hold of it. Yeah, thanks, Liz. Look, um, what we've been working together, and it's been it really draws on the power and the strength of the CBI's network with businesses, large, medium, and small, in all parts of the UK, in loads of different sectors, and in particular our trade association networks. We've been building up what we've called an insights dashboard, essentially, which gives a flavour and a picture of across all different industry sectors what are the particular issues and pinch points, uh, where are they biting. Uh, in what kind of time horizon is it now? How long is it likely to run for? Are the potential sort of solutions and so on? We've got that built up now across all different industry sectors. We've been sharing it with government to enhance their understanding of supply chains uh, and help them uh, think through potential solutions. But it's also now being made available to all CBI members. So again, check out uh, this. And I, look, I, my best guess is most firms will be totally across, of course, their own business and what's going on in their own supply chains. But as we've talked about in this session, you know, so much of this is interconnected. So if by sharing what is going on in uh, sort of adjacent related sectors and right across the economy, it helps people with their own business planning just to build up a picture of what is going on and adds a little bit of richness and colour to that, then hopefully that will be helpful for people uh, as they go about their forward plans and they can identify where some of the pinch points and spikes might be and think about how they mitigate those. So that's what we're making available is I hope people find that helpful. And I guess to close, the ask would be, look, if you're already feeding in uh, insights and information that help us put that together, please do continue to do so. It's genuinely really, really helpful. And if you're not, and you've got further insights and thoughts to share, please do get in touch because we'd love to add uh, that. The more people that are inputting to it, the richer uh, the insights become. Thanks ever so much, Matthew. Super interesting conversation this morning. I've really enjoyed it. Um, I guess my message to everybody watching or listening is keep on keeping on. Um, CBI is there to help you as much as they possibly can. Um, all that remains for me to say thank you very, very much um, to Jenny and to Matthew from the CBI and to Richard Ballantyne, Chief Executive of the British Ports Association for your time. Um, as I always say, whether you're watching or listening, wherever you are, put the kettle on before you go and open your emails and we'll see you again really soon. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.